Crossing family, how you doing today? You guys doing good? Man, I missed ya. I'm so excited I get the opportunity to hang out with you over the next couple of weeks. I wanna give a shout out to those of you here at our 48th Street location, those of you gathering our campuses all across this region. I wanna do a special shout out to those of you who are part of our online family. It is crazy to me every single week when I see our online numbers come in to realize that there are thousands of you who are watching us online every single week. And we uh, don't know all the circumstances surrounding while you're watching online. Some of you guys, you're watching online because you're traveling and you're wanting to stay connected to your church. And we love and appreciate that. We know that some of you have moved and you're in a new town and you're trying to figure out, you know, where you're going to end up going to church. And in the meantime, you're staying connected with us. And if you need help finding a great church in your community, make sure you reach out to one of our campus pastors and through our network, we'll try and make sure we get you plugged in. And then we also know that there's some of you that are still navigating health issues and others that are even trying to mitigate some of the issues related with COVID. And if there's anything that we can do, if there's something that we need to bring you, if we can help out in any way, make sure you reach out to us because you're a part of this family and we love you and we wanna care for you. I heard a story, I'm gonna get it clarified next week, but I believe somebody was watching our church online up in uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin and drove all the way down to one of our campuses to get baptized and then went back up. I'm gonna find out the real story. I heard a inkling of a rumor. I'm gonna get the real story. Uh, but isn't that cool how God is using that? Finally, those of you who are part of the Crossing Inside, I've said this before, our church across all of our locations cheers the loudest when we hear, uh, see the number recorded for your baptisms. We've been waiting for the opportunity to be able to minister to you again. It's been a long wait. We miss you, we love you, and our church is so thankful that you're a part of our family. Well, last week, Jerry preached a sermon on the covenants. And he talked to us about uh, the covenant that God made with Noah, the covenant that God made with Abraham, the covenant that God made with Moses uh, and David, and then ultimately the new covenant. And if you missed that sermon, I'm gonna encourage you to hop online at thecrossing.net, or you can go to our YouTube channel, which I think is One Crossing, and watch that because my sermon is gonna function kind of as a part two to his sermon will make more sense in the context. And so I wanna make sure you guys get an opportunity to watch that because I believe that you will enjoy it. But in that message, uh, Jerry challenged us and pushed us that we could know God personally, which is kind of one of those brain moments that you can know God personally that you can have. This is the mission of our church, an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that there is a huge difference between knowing about somebody and actually knowing someone. And there are people who talk about knowing God, uh, but really what they're, they have is they know about him. They've never actually known him. A couple weeks back, I had the opportunity to go down to Nashville with some of the people on our staff and hang out at a conference. And we got to gather with uh, church leaders from our movement all across the country. And while I was there, got an opportunity to spend some time with somebody who's kind of a big deal in our movement and kind of a mover and shaker. And I've always kind of looked up to him. And over the course of the couple of days that we were gathered, I, uh, I got their phone number. Uh, it was given to me, which was kind of like a big uh, moment for me. And I mean, when Allison gave me Jerry's phone number, like I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. Like it was a big, it was a big move for me. Um, his number is 217, <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's a big difference between knowing about somebody and actually knowing them. While I was there on the way back, I received a phone call from somebody that I, um, about somebody that I hadn't heard from since 2007 or 2008. And uh, the message that came to me was uh, navigating a bunch of loss, carrying a ton of weight in response to that, and kind of looking for some hope and some direction. And so uh, drove in here to our multi-site offices and we had an opportunity to meet for about 30 minutes. And while we were uh, talking, I asked him if he believed in God and he said, of course I do. And I said, do you believe you can have a relationship with God? And that for him was, he was trying to figure out like, of course I believe in God. I just don't know how to, I don't know how to, well, I don't know how. We've all been there. And so I, uh, I talked to him for a little bit. I made him uh, commit 
to being a part of our services at that location from now all the way until the end of our Christmas Eve services, which our Christmas Eve services are gonna be, I think, super stinking cool uh, this year. And I also said, I want you to start uh, reading your Bible. But as I was, uh, and I wanted him to start reading through the New Testament, and while I was having that conversation with him, I realized that sometimes as a pastor, I take too much for granted. I assume too much, and that there can be times where I'm not clearly answering the questions that uh, you might have or providing direction to some of the challenges that you are, that you're facing. And so if you've been here at our church for a really long time, some of what I'm gonna talk about today is gonna be a review for you. And if that's the case, so be it. Um, Think of it as like getting to kiss your wife in the kitchen. Like you've done that before, it was good, and you've done it again, and you kind of liked it, and you never know where a uh, a kiss in the kitchen might lead. So who knows what'll happen with this sermon, okay? Uh, But there's another reason, while it's review to you and it's good, there's other people uh, that are coming to our church every single week for the very first time that are starting at zero. And as a church and as a pastor, I need to make sure that I create a little bit of space for those people to to start to understand what it looks like to have that relationship with God. We see evidence that people are coming here every single week for the first time, partly in our baptism videos, because every single week there are people at our church at one of our locations starting their intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I need to make sure that there's times in my sermons where I address and contextualize some of the things that those of us who've been following Jesus for a while take for granted. For instance, when I'm talking to this guy and I say, start reading your Bible, well, I don't really mean that. Because if you start reading your Bible, uh, you're gonna open up your Bible just like you'd open up every other book. And you're gonna end up in Genesis instead of in Matthew. And you're gonna end up spending the first uh, three-fifths of your time of reading the Bible in the old covenant, the old contract that God made with the Jewish people. Instead of actually opening up your Bible to Matthew, and starting to understand who Jesus is and how you can have a right relationship with him. And don't you think if you're gonna start an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it'd be better to actually learn about Jesus in the context of the New Testament instead of the Old Testament. And I don't know why when the people put the Bible together, they put the Old Testament first because everybody, I mean, it's the only book in the world that you don't start at the beginning. Which, you know, nobody asks me to like, how do we publish a Bible? But I mean, that's, that's frustrating. I just take that much for granted. Can you imagine starting to read and you read Genesis, Exodus, and then you get into Leviticus and you're like, I feel like I'm not getting any closer to Jesus yet. No, that's okay. Well, you still got Job, Jeremiah. Like when, when are you going to like, if you start your Bible reading plan and you say, well, you know, let's really go after it for the next 12 months, read through your Bible. And they start in January. They're going to get to Jesus in September. Like we need to contextualize some of this stuff. Now, listen, uh, the Old Testament has value, tons of value. I'm not taking anything away from it. It contains the origin uh, of life. It's a great description of our description of history and God's interaction with the Jewish people. It's how you can kind of build some of your faith and see how God is working to restore humanity it has tons of value. And I mean, if you're tempted to go, man, it's, you know, leave the Old Testament alone, don't deal with it at all. I just need you to know that Jesus and the apostles quoted it like all the time. Like they were big fans. And uh, Jesus didn't come to abolish the Old Covenant or the Old Testament, he came to fulfill it. So it has value, but we need to make sure we put it in the right light. But the New Testament is God's new contract. It's his new agreement with you and me. And I don't wonder uh, how many of you are like me. I like a good contract. I mean, it's kind of crazy on the front end to think that God would allow himself to enter into a contract with you and me. That he would allow himself to be bound. That he would allow his word to be leveraged. That he would have to keep by entering into an agreement with people like you and me. All powerful, all knowing, all the wisdom in the world, and he allows himself to be confined, restrained in a contract. God's good at a lot of things, but I don't think he's a good negotiator because in this contract, God gets us and we get God. In this contract, he pays the price and we get grace. 
What kind of negotiator is God? Uh, he's not a good one. You wanna know why? Because when you love somebody, you don't negotiate well. Uh, sometimes I'll get jazzed up about uh, working the details of a contract. I, I remember the first time I got to go get my own cell phone. And some of you 30-year-olds, you don't know what that is yet because you're still on your parents. But for me, <laughs> at a young age, I had to go navigate that on my own. And, and I honestly thought I was gonna go in and like work a deal, like there was gonna be a negotiation at the cell phone place. So like I'm, I'm prepping, I'm like, all right, here we go, let's do this. And I come in, I'm like, all right, here's what I'm willing to do. And they're like, no man, this is take it or leave it. And when, I, when my parents got me my first phone, this was on them, I got the Nokia brick. And this was, some of you, you're gonna love this. This was back when there was daytime minutes and night and weekend minutes. Yeah, oh yeah. And I remember my dad kind of going, listen, uh, you can, it's free to talk as much as you want, nights and weekends. But you know, when the sun's up, stay off your phone. And if you get injured, stop the bleeding until the sun goes down <laughs> and call me. All of our cars have headlights, we'll find you. And it also came with roaming. Like there's an area where you can talk to people, but the moment you get out of that, it costs more. And this is back, and this is gonna blow some of your minds, when a text message costs 10 cents. Parents, that would be more than a mortgage for you at the rate that your kids text. And it's crazy because you still get the some standard messages or message rates might still apply. Like who's under the contract that's 10 cents a text? Like I thought that was all over with. It's the same thing when it comes to uh, vehicles. You know, I I'm shopping for my next vehicle right now. And what I mean by that is, uh, in 10 years, I'm gonna buy my next vehicle. And so I'm paying really close attention to the kind of vehicles that they're offering. And I remember being in my old 2000 Toyota Avalon and like riding in other people's cars. And there was a feature that kind of like got put in and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And that was, uh, ladies, you can back me up on this, heated seats. Oh my goodness, yeah. How about this marriage saver, dual climate control. My car's completely confused because when you get in it, uh, my wife, even through the, the, the summer months, has her heated seats on and she's running the heater and I'm over here trying to get all the cool air I can. And then the best feature of all time, and fellas, you can back me up on this. And I don't, I mean, I don't want to flaunt my wealth, but my car has the air conditioned seats. Oh, Jesus Christ, I love you so much. <laughs> the fact that he put wisdom and inside of the human brain to go, we've got to figure out how to get air conditioning on Clayton's booty is a huge <laughs> win for me. It's fantastic. And backup cameras, I don't know how many bicycles I would have ran over. If I, how, how are there still kids? Because for years there was no backup camera. But now I just, you know, I can see it all. Anybody can back up now. And I got into a vehicle, I got into a, two th I went from one Toyota Avalon to another one. And the only thing when I was like, listen, when I buy this thing, it's gotta have air conditioned seats. And I went to a place and they're like, hey, we've got a great car for you, it's a great deal. First thing I get in, I sit down, I look for the air conditioned seats. I'm like, guys, it doesn't have that. I'm like, yeah, but everything else is great. I'm like, listen, man, I only buy a car every 10 years. So if I don't get the air conditioned booty now, it's never gonna happen. And I was ready to enter into the right contract because it had the right terms, it had the right benefits. Well, what I wanna do is I wanna to talk to you about three things that happen in the new contract, the new agreement that God makes with you and me. The first one is what does it look like to live under the new contract is that the new contract is written on our hearts. It's written on our hearts and we get the picture of this out of an obscure place. We get it in the Old Testament by a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's entire life was marked by serving God, pain, suffering, torment, and loneliness. He dealt with political turmoil, cultural revolt, religious oppression. And God speaks to him in the midst of his pain and says, in the future, I'm gonna make a new covenant, a new contract with the people. And then we get to hear what the new contract looks like. Jeremiah 31. 
This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the, uh, the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will, check this out, forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. How does he accomplish this? Well, he accomplishes this through Jesus Christ. He satisfies the sin issue through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And then the writing of the new covenant on our hearts and in our minds is through the Holy Spirit. That when you decide to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and you become obedient in the waters of baptism, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that that baptism is kind of like the marriage of the sinner to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit, he stops working on you and he starts working in you. And he takes up residence in your life and you get access to godly power and godly wisdom. And God's ways are seared into your heart. You're given a divine compass to help you navigate life's challenges and help your spiritual growth in Christ to develop. Now, I know that some of you, you're real Lewis and Clarkers. You're adventure bums, and you, you, when it comes to compasses, you're like, oh yeah, man, I get it. But for the rest of us, just humor me for a second. Uh, there's two Norths. There's true North, and there's magnetic North. Now, if uh, I don't know if it works for other phones, but I know it works for an iPhone. When you get home today, um, if you have more than one iPhone in your house or a friend, uh, put your iPhone next to somebody else's, right up next to each other, and put go into the settings and put one on True North and one on Magnetic North, and they will be off. Here in the tri-state area, they'll be off by, hold on here, one degree. And you're like, Clayton, one degree. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, listen to me, I agree. It doesn't sound that much. However, at 100 yards, you'd be off by 5.2 feet. At a mile, you'd be off by 92 feet. You can still see it, but you're not where you're supposed to be. In other words, if we were to all hop on a plane and fly from uh, Chicago O'Hare down to St. Louis, and the pilot was only off one degree, when we landed, they wouldn't come over the PA and say, hey, as you uh, unbuckle and stand up, please be careful when you open up the overhead compartments as some of your baggage may have shifted during the flight. They'll be saying, your flotation device is located underneath you, and I hope you can swim because we're in the Mississippi River. One degree. And one degree, uh, the issues that happen with one degree are two things. Uh, the first one is speed that the faster you go only one degree off, the further you get off course. And I wonder what one degree looks like in your marriage, in your parenting, in your finances, in the choices that you're making with your life, how you handle conflict and friendships. What happens if you're just off one degree? And you couple that with how fast you're moving through life. The universal response that I get when I talk to people about, hey, how are you doing? How are things going? And they say to me, I'm just so busy. How are things going? Oh, we've just been so busy with all the kids' sports. Man, how are you holding up? Man, we've just been busy with all the grandkids coming over. We've been watching them and navigating that. How are you holding up? Well, it's just been super busy at work. We can't get, find anybody to work, so we've been doing double shifts. Everybody I talk to is just so busy. I don't ever talk to somebody whose life is going slow. Like, how are you doing? Pretty good, man. This, I mean, things have been pretty, I mean, this is the only thing I've done this week, is talk to you. And I think I'm gonna do it next week. Like, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fit some eating in, if I can, some naps. Yeah, I don't feel like that's ever the response I get. So here's what, I wanna, here's what I wanna hit you with. If we're going through life fast, one degree becomes a big problem fast. 
you find yourself off course. And that is if you're only off one degree, which I think is pretty optimistic. I mean, you, you think about the strong magnetic pull of politics, culture, education, and social media, the internal magnetic pull that you and I have for power, sex, and money, and we move the needle of the compass even further. So we could be going through life super fast and way more than one degree off, and who knows where we'll end up. And you've seen this happen before. All of a sudden, the kids are out of the house. The marriage hasn't been tended to for years. They're completely unsatisfied in their job, and what do I do? I don't have my kids to distract me. I don't have a spouse that loves me, and I don't have a job that gives me purpose. And we all know somebody who fits in that category. We're going fast. We could be off by just a bit. This is why the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is so special and necessary. He not only guides us on the right path and points us towards true north, but he also gives us the power to make the right and necessary steps. Uh, the best decision I ever made was making Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. I've said that before when I land the plane here at 48th Street. And my biggest regret is that I didn't do it sooner. And the reason why it's my best decision and my biggest regret is the fact that I didn't do it sooner is because the carnage in my life from being a couple of degrees off, the earthly ramifications that I experienced by being a couple of degrees off, that's why I'm so thankful for our zero to 18 ministries at all of our different locations and all the staff and volunteers that regularly serve and pour into our kids because they are calibrating their precious little hearts to true north as early as humanly possible so that they don't have to navigate all the pain and sorrow that you and I had to navigate. They don't have to be riddled with guilt and shame like you and I have been riddled with guilt and shame. So I'm also so thankful for our regeneration ministry that helps people who've gone through life a couple of degrees off and they've gone through life pretty quick and all of a sudden they find a relationship with Jesus Christ and even though the relationship with Jesus is made right instantly, there's a lot of earthly ramifications that need to be sorted out. And the precious people that are part of our regeneration ministry come alongside people, not only help them find that right vertical relationship with Jesus Christ, but help them, have them uh, learn how to navigate some of the horizontal realities. The second thing that the new contract provides is perfect forgiveness of sins. This idea is too big and beautiful for us to fairly unpack. Under the old contract, once a year, uh, one person would go behind the curtain that separated in the temple uh, the most holy of holies, and he would go in and he would offer one sacrifice for the sins of the people for that year. When Jesus uh, was crucified on the cross, across town in of Jerusalem in the temple, something mysteriously magical took place. The huge curtain that was too thick for anybody to tear with human hands was actually torn from top to bottom. As if God was separating it and saying there's no longer any separation between me and you. Your sin will no longer keep you distanced from me because in this new contract, I have provided complete forgiveness. I have forgiven their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance uh, that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. So with God, you don't have to have a guilty conscience because it's been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus and having our bodies washed with pure water. That when you come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you are baptized into the family of God, you become at home with him. You've been completely forgiven. You've been perfectly forgiven. There's no longer any separation or animosity. Have you ever wronged somebody and it's awkward? Like you said something mean to a family member and then you actually have to go to the family event and they're there. And you're a little nervous walking in. 
With God, there's been, there's no more animosity, there's no more separation, all has been made right. It's the difference between going over to somebody else's house and being in your own house. Have you ever been invited over to somebody's house and you had to take the whole family? Isn't that the worst, right? You're like, you're, you gotta get dressed, you gotta dress right, you gotta make sure you look okay. Your wife is saying, you know, she's t- licking her, her, uh, her fingers and smoothing over your boys' hair and then you have to stand in front of their house and you, you ring the doorbell and then you try and look like you're a happy family when they open the doors if they're gonna take a picture. <laughs> and then you go in and I have a kind of a, I mean, I love to eat, but I have a stomach that fights me. So my deal is, is you, you, my parents, you know, you, you eat whatever they give you and you eat it all. And then people will be like, oh, you're a big guy. Whoosh, whoosh. Like, oh, this is gonna take a lot of prayer to get this down, right? And then what I do early on is I do a bathroom survey. Like, I wanna know if I have to have an away game. You wanna find the plunger before you need the plunger. Am I right? Okay, you don't, right? Now, and you, you sit there and, you, you know, you don't tell any of the same jokes you tell at your own house. You just, oh, yeah, <laughs> the weather, right? You, you put it on. But when you're at your own house, like I have clothes that my wife absolutely hates. Like I have a cut off sweatshirt that, uh, that I've like cut off the sleeves and most of whatever's supposed to go around your neck, it's not even a collar anymore. And I, I put that on and my wife hates it and that's what I'm mowing. That and some knee high socks and some slippers. You know why I do that? Cause I'm home. And when my kids fart at the dinner table, I'm like, you know, reload, son. Like, you got any others? Because I'm home. And what happened inside of your relationship with God is when Jesus Christ died on the cross and you accept what he did, he makes you at home with God. My my kids run into the house filthy from playing and they can curl up on their mom and get a kiss and snuggle because they're home. and you have been made home with God. Third thing, the new contract is for all people. We find this in the very first gospel message that is ever preached, Acts chapter two, verses 38 through 39. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've already talked about both of those things. The promise, is for you and your children and for all who are far off. At all of our locations say far off. Far off. off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. It is for all people. In the Greek, if you're wanting to get serious with it, the word all means all. Now I wanna do a funny, uh, scary thing with you. I want you to think of the worst people you can think of. Get them in your mind. Who's the worst group of people you can think of? People who do horrible things. People who believe and ascribe to values that you find uh, ridiculous, okay? On the count of three, we're gonna say it out loud. You're like, ooh, I don't know if I'd have sat next to this person. If I'd have known that I was gonna be saying this about them. Okay, some of you are looking around the room for ideas. That guy, that guy's the worst, okay? You don't have to say it super loud, but let's all, every location, everywhere you're at, one, two, three. Yeah, okay. (laughs) I mean, Clayton, I mean, uh, you could have said Bears fans, right? You could have said that. I'm just messing. Uh, You could have said Republicans. You could have said Democrats. You could have said abusers, drug dealers, aborters, molesters, pedophiles. Uh, You could have said Clayton. That's the truth. I'm uh, probably the worst person I know. I know all the thoughts that go through my head. I know all the emotions and feelings that I have. You could have said me. Being a part of the crossing for a really long time I've had my fair share of crossing uh, swag mug shots. Um, it's just kind of like the, what happens around here. Bugs the snot out of me on some level. 
One time a guy in Macomb uh, wrecked his car drunk driving. He had so many uh, crossing shirts in his car that the police thought he was on staff. So they called to give me a heads up. And I'm like, nope, uh, but he is one of our greeters. Uh, we had a great youth coach uh, get busted for drunk driving, wearing, of course, a crossing youth uh, shirt. A couple weeks ago, uh, here in Quincy, we had a person rocking a crossing uh, shirt uh, stiff a local restaurant. And they posted it on social media, and I was sitting at home watching all the people rationalize why a person from the crossing would just not pay their cheese and rice bill. Yeah, well, fortunately, there's people from our church that went and tried to, to pay it and satisfy. Yeah. One time, I was in Ace up in Macomb, and a, a guy cornered me and started to get up in my face because uh, he had been somewhere in town, and a guy with a crossing uh, Easter at the crossing sign in his yard and a crossing sweatshirt came out and started cussing uh, all these people out. He's like, what kind of people you got going there? Well, the problem was that guy didn't go to our church. Uh, his wife did, and I feel like she should be able to invite people to church even though her husband wasn't going. Oh, and the guy wearing the sweat, I mean, the fact that he was wearing the sweatshirt is because people in his family bought him some crossing swag. I also didn't have the heart to tell him that the guy who was doing that was my father-in-law. <laughs> you know, there's my family representing. Uh, but my father-in-law didn't go to church yet. But he does now. My father-in-law hadn't been baptized yet but he has now. My father-in-law hadn't started reading his Bible and praying and giving to advance the mission like he is now. He, just like you and me, has a long way to go, but God had started a work in him, and at that moment in time, in that snapshot, he wasn't the best representative of our church, and he's still not. I gotta be honest with you, I'm still not. I mean, I gotta be honest with you. It kind of bugs me that people who call the church home go out and act like complete jack wagons in our community. And at the same time, I'm going, yeah, that's us. That's actually who we are. There actually has to be a place for messed up, broken, beat down people to find the perfect love of Jesus Christ. There, there has to be a place. I mean, what would you go to the hospital with the same level of snootiness? The doors open up. Oh my goodness. There is sick people in there. Lots of them, like almost all of the people in there are sick. There are some people over there that have headaches and I think we all know they're hiding something. There's some people over there that, you know, they've got cancer and I don't want to be any closer to them. And then apparently there's a whole place inside this building for people with COVID. I can't believe they're putting all the COVID people all together in one place. Right? You look at that person and go, you know you're an idiot, right? Because where are sick people supposed to go? Sick people deserve and belong in a hospital. That's where they're supposed to be. And don't you think that there has to be a place for sinners to connect with your Savior? I'm tempted to say that place is here, and that place is with us, and that place is with you, and that place is with me. Where else are you going to get it? I mean, where else are you going to get the hope that satisfies? I, I've been to hy V to get the donuts. I didn't get hope there. I've been to Casey's to get the breakfast pizza. The bacon's the best. My doctor made me dairy-free this week. I'm a little on edge. <laughs> and I didn't get peace there either. I've been to colleges and universities, and I didn't find mercy. I've been to bars and ball games, and I didn't find it there. There has to be a place. And I say here.
There has to be a place that boldly holds up the new contract to not just the people who've been abused, but also to the abuser, not just people who have a past and not just people who have a present, but somebody who holds up the new contract made possible by Jesus Christ and says, you can have a future. There has to be a place that never tires of making sure that God is famous, that we lift up that we lift up his unending love, that we never tire of making famous his barrier breaking, soul healing, justice embodying, shackle shattering, sin conquering beauty that was made possible in the new covenant. And for years as a pastor, I used to have so much grace for people who would say things like, well, it's just hard for me to talk to people about Jesus because I just don't know enough. And I get it, it can be a little complicated. And I used to have patience for people who go, man, I don't know how I feel about, you know, talking to some of my friends about Jesus because I don't want to be the weird person in the room. And I get that sometimes, you know, you don't want to be the Jesus freak in your workplace. I used to have grace for that until COVID. And I saw people who could barely get a GED string together their theory on viruses. And I saw people that could barely find their way to a voting booth come become the, the architects of conspiracy theories. And I saw people who didn't have the ability or didn't take the time to study the scriptures and understand what God has done for them become absolute advocates for whether you vaccine people or you don't and whether you mask people or you don't. The part that bugs me is how come politics and COVID have taken up so much residence in our heart that we would be okay with actually learning and studying so we could have an opinion and we're okay with saying controversial things even though it pushes other people away. Why would we be willing to give so much of our heart and passion and life over to those things and not be willing to give it up to Jesus who gave it all for us? I'm convinced that if we were a tenth as passionate about helping people find an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ as we are about getting people vaccinated, we'd be running eight services a weekend at all of our locations. Now, I know some of you are going, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, let me say it the other way. If we were half as passionate as we are about getting the masks off our kids at school, we'd run out of baptistry towels and baptism shirts, and we'd have to refill the water because people would be carrying too much out with them when they got in. What happened to us? Did we fall out of love with what Jesus did for us? What happened? I'm gonna ask you a question. All of our locations, testify with me for just a second. How many of you would say that the very best thing that ever happened to you was you started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And how many of you would just say your biggest regret is you didn't do it sooner? Then shame on us for not acting like that. We're moving to a time of decision.